Well, good morning, everybody, and happy Monday. I hope you had a wonderful weekend and that you were in church Sunday. If for any reason you missed, go to the church website, fbcrockhill.org, and watch one of the live stream of the services from this past Sunday. Well, today we are reading the book of Malachi, the last book in your Old Testament. Malachi uh, was a prophet who lived and served about 100 years after the Jewish people who had been exiled to Babylon returned back to Jerusalem. So he was after the time of Zechariah, after the time of Haggai. He was uh, ministering approximately at the same time as Nehemiah and maybe a little bit after Nehemiah, there's internal evidence in the book as to why we know that, that I'm not going to bore you with right now, but that's that's when he was a prophet. The, uh, the, the people were discouraged and they were spiritually uh, not healthy. They were just going through the motions. They weren't giving God anything close to their best. The book is organized, if you will, around a series of questions, questions the people are asking. And in the in the text, it's as though God repeats the what you say. So questions the people are asking about God, and questions that God in turn asks the people to make them think and come face to face with certain realities. And um, and you see that at the very beginning. So let's you know verse one. You know it's God's word to Israel through Malachi. Then verse two, God says, "I have loved you." says the Lord. But you say, God saying, but you say, or Malachi to the people, but you say, here's the question the people were asking. God says, I love you, but all the people are asking, how have you loved us? How? They were discouraged because it was still tough. I mean, they had rebuilt the city. They had rebuilt the temple. They, uh, they, they were bringing sacrifices to the altar at the temple. But the country was still in kind of rough shape. I mean, it wasn't like the glory days of David and Solomon and so on. Um, uh, The economy was not what it had been. I mean, the devastation of the war with Babylon and the the 70-year captivity, life was still hard. So God, we don't see the evidence. You don't, you, you, no. How have you loved us? And God reminds them at the end of verse two and in verse three, He says, uh, was not Esau Jacob's brother, declares the Lord? Yet I have loved Jacob, but I have hated Esau and have made his mountains a desolation and appointed his inheritance to the jackals of the wilderness. And on and on. Going back to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Isaac's children, Jacob and Esau, and God's promise to make a great nation of Abraham's descendants, so to speak, through Jacob's descendants, through Jacob, not through Esau. When he says he hated Esau, it doesn't mean God literally hated Esau. It just means he chose Jacob over Esau to be the one through whom the promise of the Jewish people was fulfilled. So it's using this hyperbolic language. Uh, In fact, when you read the Old Testament accounts, God loved Esau, blessed Esau. And later in life, Esau... Um, uh, looks like he kind of turned to the Lord. So, and, and by the way, also that's not talking about individual salvation. It's simply talking about what was the mechanism through which God accomplished his purpose of having a nation? Jacob, not Esau. So when you read this and you read Romans and, and you try to make that about God choosing this person for salvation and that person for damnation, you you corrupt what the text is actually truly teaching. It's not about individual salvation, about God's mechanism for choosing the nation of Israel. It was through Jacob, not through Esau. And God says, so your whole is, your whole history demonstrates that I love the nation of Israel, that I love the Jewish people, God is saying. And the fact that Esau's descendants, known as the country of Edom, that were also destroyed and taken into captivity by the Babylonians, they had not yet been restored like the Jewish nation had been restored. And God said, even if they come back and try to rebuild in the following verses, they're never going to be a strong nation again. So I've loved you, but you've forgotten that. Then there's another question over, and this really gets to the heart 
of, 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 of their practice. Um, verses six and seven, God says to the people, a son honors his father, a servant his master. Then if I am a father, if I am your father, where is my honor? God's asking the people, where is my honor? And uh, if I am a master, where is my respect? Says the Lord of hosts to you. O priest, the Jewish priest, who despise my name, despise God's name. But you say, how have we despised your name? Verse seven, you are presenting defiled food upon my altar. But you say, how have we defiled you? In that you say, the table of the Lord is to be despised when you present, in verse eight, blind, the blind for sacrifices. Is it not Evil. You present the lame and the sick. Is it not evil? In other words, there were very clear guidelines in the Old Testament that when people brought animals for sacrifice to the temple, to the altar of God, to the table of God, they were to give their best, not their worst. They were to give those without blemish, without spot, without defilement, without any weakness, without any, any defects, injuries, disease. And they were bringing to God the very thing they were not supposed to bring, the defiled. They were bringing the cheapest. I, I can give God this little bit, but this over here, this that I, my best, no. And, and, and the priests were accepting it. So the priests were as guilty as the people. And then in the middle of verse 8, after, after talking about what they were giving, God asked the people, through, the, through prophet Malachi, he asked the people, why not offer it? The offerings, you're bringing these blind animals, these lame animals, these, these sick animals as a sacrifice. Why not offer it to your governor? Would he be pleased with you? Would he receive you kindly, says the Lord? But that's what you do to God. You give God what you would not even consider giving to the governor. You give to God what you would be embarrassed to give to the government, to the governor. Wow. And then in verse 9, he said, but you still pray to me and want me to bless you. Oh, wow. And yet how many of us go to church and sing our songs and so on? And we give God our leftovers. We give God a tip, not a tithe, if we give him anything at all. Aren't we doing what they did? Aren't we failing to honor God? And are we not despising his name when we treat God like that? When we give God our leftovers. If I have time, I will. If there's any money left, I will. I'll give you a tip. God, don't ask me to give you first. Don't ask me to give you my very best. But, oh, God, when I need something, oh, God, when I want something, God says, you, there, there are people you won't treat that way. And yet you treat God that way. That was the situation in Malachi's day, and that's the message of Malachi chapter 1. We don't take animals to the temple to sacrifice, but the Bible says we are a living sacrifice. So let me ask you, what kind of, what kind of uh, sacrifice are you in the eyes of God? And do you give God less than you give other people? Something to think about. I'll see you tomorrow as we look at chapter two. God bless you, everybody.